We're here today to mark the installation of our commemorative panel for the internment of thousands of Ukrainians and other Europeans from 1914 to 1920. I'm very pleased to be here with you all. Um, as someone that is of Ukrainian descent, my grandparents uh, came here prior to World War II, but we did not know about this moment in our history at all growing up. It wasn't until about roughly a year ago for myself that I became aware of what happened uh, during 1914 to 1920. And so from then on, I've had the great privilege of working with the UCCLF and people like Boris Sidorak to help uh, commemorate and educate people about what happened in our past. Um, and today I think of my grandparents and my grandfather who fought in World War II and still didn't know about this and still wasn't aware of what occurred. And so being here today, it's great to be able to commemorate this and to be able to make sure that we as a society can learn and move forward with what's occurred and uh, make sure that we do better as we move forward. During Canada's first national internment operations of 1914 to 1920, 8,579 men, some women, some children, were interned by the Canadian government acting under the authority of the War Measures Act. While most were recent immigrants from the multinational Austro-Hungarian, German and Ottoman empires and the Kingdom of Bulgaria, some were Canadian born or naturalized British subjects. Most of the civilian internees came from the western regions of Halachana, Bukovena, and Zakarpatia. Held in 24 receiving stations and internment camps across the country, from the Naimo, British Columbia, to the Citadel in Hal Halifax, Nova Scotia, these second class prisoners of war were generally separated from the first class Germans and Austrian POWs. Many were transported into the country's frontier wildernesses and obliged to work for the profit of their jailers. Personal wealth and property were confiscated, not all which was returned on parole or following the end of the internment operations. Canada's first national internment operations were shaped by pre-war prejudices and were exacerbated by wartime xenophobia. Between 1891 and the outbreak of the First World War, some 170,000 Ukrainian immigrants arrived in Canada, lured to the Dominion with the promises of freedom and free land. Only a few years after these pioneer settlers arrived in the Northwest Territories, as this area was called, a clergyman, for Father Morris, expressed his loathing for them in the Calgary Daily Herald. On January 27, 1899, it was written, as for the Halachane, I have not met a single person in the whole of the Northwest who is sympathetic to them. They are, from the point of civilization, 10 times lower than the Indians. They have not the least idea of sanitation. In their personal habits and acts, they resemble animals. And even in the streets of Edmonton, when they come to market, men, women, and children would, if unchecked, turn the place into a common sewer. Such bigotry persisted into the immediate post-war period. An inflammatory editorial in the Fe on Fe February 10th, 1919, in the Winnipeg Telegram, demanding enemy aliens must go, questioned whether it was necessary to import a race of inferior being beings to do our work, or write for returning soldiers to compete with the bohunks of Central Europe, who have been accustomed in their own country to be to submit to being driven like cattle, who are ignorant of every principle of sanitation and lost to all sense of decency and living conditions. The writer insisted that returned soldiers or any other white men must be given decent working conditions. And if those conditions in any occupation at present are unfit for a white man, then they must be made fit. It will be unnecessary to depend on enemy aliens for labor to develop the resources of Canada. Evidently, the Ukrainians, Croatians, Serbs, Bulgarians, Hungarians, and other Eastern Europeans herded into Canadian concentration camps were not as white as some label them today. Instead, they were racialized. Internees were exploited for the labor in the national parks of Western Canada. They built roads, they cleared bush, they cut trails, even building a portion of the golf course, the Bamp Springs Hotel. 
Others helped carve experimental farms out of the boreal wildernesses at Kapuskasin in northern Ontario and at Spirit Lake in northern Quebec. Conditions were trying. The guards were, in, were sometimes brutal, and so resentment at what many regarded as their unjust confinement was wide, widespread, provoking resistance, some passive, such as work slowdowns. Other efforts were more determined, including escape attempts and even a massive riot, including 1,200 internees at Kappa's Casing in Northern Ontario in May of 1916, which required the intervention of some 300 uh, armed soldiers to put it down. In total, 107 internees died in captivity. Six were shot dead while trying to escape. Others succumbed to infectious diseases, work-related injuries and suicide. In many cases, they were buried in unmarked graves or cemeteries far from their communities and loved ones. Their final resting place all but forgotten. Efforts to secure acknowledgement and redress for Canada's first national internment operations began in 1978, after Nick Sakuluk provided testimony to Lubomir Lutsuk about his experience as an internee at Fort Henry in Kingston, Ontario, and then Petawawa and then Kappa's Gasing Camps telling of a story the Ukrainian com Canadian community had all but forgotten. Yet almost a decade would pass before a concerted campaign to right this historic injustice began, spearheaded by the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association under the chairmanship of Mr. John Gregorovich. During the First World War, thousands of Ukrainians and other Europeans found themselves targeted for internment and other repressive measures, not because of anything they did, but only because who they were and where they came from. The crippling legacy of what happened to them would endure and would be detected decades later by the RCMP informant who in August of 1941 told the superiors how some Ukrainian Canadians were still afraid of the barbed wire fence. On behalf of the UCC Calgary branch, I would like to express our deepest gratitude to the city of Calgary for allowing the installation of these plaques uh, and to Boris Sidoruk and the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Foundation for their tireless efforts in preserving the historical truth and sharing the stories of those affected by the internment operations in Canada. Their work ensures that the voices of victims are heard and the injustices suffered are acknowledged. We are indebted to their commitment to justice and human rights. The Ukrainian Canadian Congress is a national voice of over 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians with several dozen local branches across Canada. It is an umbrella organization that brings together various Ukrainian Canadian organizations and community groups across the country to promote Ukrainian Canadian identity, heritage, and, well and the well being of our community. Our mission is to foster unity, promote human rights, and advance the interests of Ukrainians in Canada. One focus of the UCC is to ensure the recognition and remembrance of the Canadian First World War internment operation. The UCC joined with the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Taras Shevchenko and the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association to represent and seek redress for this tragedy and to bring healing to the Ukrainian Canadian community. Bill C-331, namely the Internment of Persons of Ukrainian Origin Recognitions Act, was passed in 2005, which led to the establishment of the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund in 2008, the fund that is uh, actually funding this plaque here today. This was a direct result of the efforts of UCC, UCCLA, and the Foundation of Taras Shevchenko. And in Calgary, we have been very fortunate to have Boris Sidoruk as our connection to these efforts. The Calgary Ukrainian community has been on the forefront of recognition and remembrance of these injustices with the install installation of the Castle Mountain Monument in 1995 and now with the installation of this plaque. Now let us reflect on the First World War internment operations that targeted Ukrainians and other European ethnic groups in Canada from 1914 to 1920. It is a part of history that has often been overlooked and forgotten. During the, this period, thousands of Ukrainians who had immigrated to Canada seeking a better life were wrongfully interned as enemy aliens solely based on their ethnic background. These innocent men, women, and children were subjected to imprisonment, forced labor, and separation from their families, all under the guise of national security. These individuals were interned not for something that they had done, but simply because of where they had come from. These internment camps were reflective of the government's gross infringement on civil liberties of its citizens and immigrants to Canada at that time. Just imagine this. You're a parent. 
a parent who simply wants the best for your family. You begin reading about this faraway land which promises freedom, prosperity, and opportunity. Something that seems to be more of a foreign concept, but certainly one that which you desire. You look in the eyes of your children, and you begin picturing the future which you want to provide them. And so you finally build the courage to leave your entire life, your belongings, your friendships, and your home to a faraway promised land. You quickly pack your entire life into usually one or two very heavy cases, and you start, you start your several month journey across Europe, get herded onto a boat, and finally arrive in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You have no way to communicate with those greeting you, and in a rush, your passport gets stamped, and you find yourself on a train going somewhere. You finally arrive at your destination, one of which you've probably never heard of, and are given, um, you, and are given an ax, some food, and land of forests and grass. You spend years harvesting the lands, learning how to survive in our brutal Canadian winters, building a home, and learning a foreign language and culture. You finally start calling yourself a Canadian. You look back at your life and what you've accomplished with pride, and this hope for the future for your children is now becoming a reality. You notice that your neighbor hasn't been going to church now for several weeks. While walking to the general store to purchase some flour, you get scolded by the postman walking by, you get spit at by the local par carpenter, and the children in the, in the town start pointing at you and laughing. And you just wonder why. You come home with the flour needed to bake the Easter bread or Paschas that you've been waiting all year for, but you're greeted by the NRCMP officer yelling and forcing your children out of the house, grabbing the flour out of your hands and putting you in handcuffs. You wake up several days later, being thrown into a barbed wire compound. You look up and you see that neighbor, that neighbor that's been missing church, who looks defeated, cold, and hungry. The same neighbor that you just celebrated Ukrainian Christmas several months ago, caroling from house to house. You turn and you look into the eyes of your children again, and now this hope, this imagined future is blank. It's stolen, it's gone. The land you cleared, the home you built, the memories you made, gone. But why? Nobody knew, nobody was willing to answer. You just look down at them and you clear the forest. And now all you can think of is how your courage and hope for a promise for a promised future only stole the childhood away from your children. All of us here today would never wish this upon anyone. We would never want something like this to be repeated. And the importance of remembering the atrocities of the past is amplified by the ongoing genocidal war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, these kinds of stories, the stories of children being stolen and childhoods being stolen, is all too familiar to Ukrainians, even in 2023. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia and its subsequent war crimes and genocide against the Ukrainian people serve as a stark reminder of what can happen when atrocities and hardships of the past are not acknowledged and remembered. It is absolutely critical that we continue to raise awareness of the internment operations, honor the victims of the atrocities, and ensure this dark history in the past is included in all school curriculums across the country. It is essential that we learn from history and actively work to prevent such injustices from occurring again. The symbolism of having these pla this plaque installed in Ukrainian Pioneers Park is profound. This park holds immense historical significance for our community as it represents resilience, determination, and contribution of Ukrainian pioneers who have settled in this region. By placing these, this memorial plaque here, we not only honor the memory of those who suffered during the internment operations, but also affirm the enduring spirit of our community. We pay tribute to those who faced injustice and remind ourselves of our strengths, resilience, uh, that has defined our community throughout history. On this occasion, we extend our deepest appreciation to the City of Calgary for allowing the installation of this plaque. Your support demonstrates a commitment to recognizing and acknowledging the past, fostering inclusivity and promoting cultural understanding. We're grateful to Mayor Gondek for being here today and for your continuous support of the Ukrainian community in Calgary. Your presence reinforces the bond between our community and the city that we call home. In conclusion, the unveiling of this memorial plaque is another significant step in our journey towards remembrance, justice, and reconciliation. Let us always remember that the sacrifices and hardships endured by our ancestors during the First World War internment operation. May their legacy inspire us to build a future where peace, understanding, and respect prevail. And may Ukraine and Ukrainians continue to display this bravery, strength, and determination as we fight yet another force trying to wipe out our culture and language. And I hope that we soon gather here again, this time though, to unveil another installation honoring Ukraine's victory against Russian, um, the Russian Federation. Slavo Ukraini. Dobra Hrenko, moi druzi. 
On behalf of my Calgary City Council colleagues and all Calgarians, thank you to the Ukrainian Civil Liberties Foundation for putting on this important event to commemorate the history that has often been left untold because it's just not pretty. But if we do not highlight the wrongs of the past, we stand to repeat them. Between 1914 and 1920, Canada unjustly declared Ukrainian people in this country to be enemy aliens. They were then imprisoned in internment operations. It is a shameful point in history, and yet Ukrainian Canadians persevered. You faced down discrimination and you stood yourselves back up again. Sadly, back home in Ukraine, you are once again having to stand up for yourselves. We acknowledge that five of the 24 internment camps and receiving stations were located here in Alberta. Mr. Sidoric's verbatim accounts of the things that were said about Ukrainian people during the internment are absolutely horrifying. But you cannot bury that past. Dr. Musienko's narrative of what families went through, let those words sink in, because we must never forget the past. Today, I am grateful to say the Calgary City Council stands in unity with the Ukrainian community and with all the organizations in our city and region that have stepped up to help those that continue to flee violence in Ukraine. Our world is fragile. We must stand up for one another. We will be with you when the recovery starts. We will rebuild Ukraine together. I should also point out that MP Michelle Rempel Garner would echo these words. Unfortunately, she is stuck in Ottawa with a canceled flight. Diakiu and thank you. Calgary Svama, Slava Ukraini.